Hello everyone, I'm Bob and this is the Home Bitcoin Immersion Mining Channel. In today's design episode, we're going to cover minor control systems and handling system failures. So with that, let's get started. Okay, in this episode, we're going to cover design of a control system for a Home Bitcoin Immersion Mining setup. And the big question to ask is, why? As in, why is this needed? Uh, why can't we just plug in the miners into the wall and just run them? Well, the answer is you can, and many home operators run their miners in this way. Now, if this is the way you intend to run your home system, then this episode is probably not for you. However, if you're like me and you want to build a mining system that is as safe and reliable as your other home infrastructure systems, such as your furnace or your air conditioner, you want to add some sort of control system to your miner setup to handle situations when things go wrong. And one of the big reasons why a control system is a good idea is the cost of Bitcoin miners themselves. Depending on when and where you bought your miner, you could have paid anything from under 2,000 bucks to maybe up to 20 grand per miner. Uh, if you have a two miner setup, that means you might have up to 40 grand invested in your mining hardware. Now, miners are designed and built with internal safety mechanisms to protect your miners when things go wrong. However, some of these safety mechanisms will allow your miners to operate significantly outside their normal operational environment before they shut themselves off. And so if something goes wrong, the miner will protect itself and will turn itself off, but it may have sustained some latent damage that could reduce its long-term reliability. So to protect your miner investment, it's probably a good idea to add some sort of control system. And this control system should do two things. Uh, number one, shut down the miners before they get anywhere near their operational limits. And number two, keep them shut down until you can step in and figure out what went wrong and fix whatever needs to be fixed. So how do you build a home Bitcoin immersion mining control system? Uh, well, nothing really seems to exist out in the open market, so we're going to have to start from scratch. And the first step is to look at each part of the mining cooling loop and think about what it does, how it could fail, and what happens if it does fail. Now, the first part of the system to look at is the tank and piping. As for what it does, well, it holds and routes the cooling fluid. And for how it could fail, well, the tank or piping could spring a leak. Now, if that happens, the fluid level in the tank will start to drop. And if this continues, the fluid level will eventually get low enough that air will get into the hot coolant outlet. Uh, when this happens, the pump will lose its inlet flow and will stop circulating fluid, and then your miners will eventually overheat. Now, next up is the pump and again the piping. Of course, these circulate the fluid in the miner cooling loop. And when it comes to failing, the pump itself can fail due to an interruption of power or just by wearing out over time, and the pipelines could also become obstructed or blocked somehow. And of course, if any of this happens, the outcome is that the fluid will stop circulating and again, the miners will overheat. Last up is the heat exchanger and secondary cooling loop. Now we could separate and analyze each of these individually and get into the secondary cooling loop and analyze each of these components, but we're gonna keep things simple. We're just going to treat all this together as a single component. And the reason why we're lumping all this together is that if any part of the secondary cooling loop or heat exchanger fails, the effect is the same. Uh, the secondary cooling loop will stop transferring heat away from the primary minor cooling loop, and the fluid temperature in the mining cooling loop will eventually start to rise, and once again, the miners will overheat. So taking all of this together, there are three things to watch to make sure the mining system is working well. Uh, number one, the fluid level. Uh, we need to make sure that we detect any leaks or any fluid loss in the system. Uh, number two, the fluid flow. Uh, we need to detect if the cooling fluid has stopped moving. And number three, the fluid temperature. We need to detect if their heat exchanger or secondary cooling loop has stopped working and the system is starting to heat up. Now, we could start designing the control system with these three things to watch, but there's something we can simplify here. If we think about the case where the fluid level starts to drop due to some leak in the system, eventually the fluid level will drop low enough that air will get into the pump. Now, this isn't gonna be great for the pump, but as soon as this happens, the pump will stop circulating fluid, and at this point, the effect is the same as if we have a pump failure. And this means we really don't have to monitor the fluid level. 
if we just watch the fluid flow and the fluid temperature, we'll be able to catch most system problems. So now we have just two things we need to monitor, fluid flow and fluid temperature. And so the next question to ask in the control system design is what do we do when the fluid flow stops or when the temperature gets too high? Well, in either case, if we don't act, the miners will overheat, and the miners will hit their temperature limits and eventually shut themselves down. And in that process, the miners might be damaged, reducing their long-term reliability. So the best thing we can do when something goes wrong is to simply shut down the miners, shut them down early before they hit their temperature limits. Now, if we do shut down the miners, they won't be mining Bitcoin and we'll take a loss there, but they also will survive to mine Bitcoin in the future. And so again, our picture here is the long run to make a very reliable system that will last for years. Now, the other hardware we also have somewhat of an investment in and we want to protect is that pump. Uh, running a circulator pump with air going into the inlet is really bad for the pump. It will quickly damage the impeller assembly and eventually damage or destroy the pump. So if the fluid level drops in addition to turning off the miners, we also want to shut the pump down. Hey folks, just a quick reminder to hit that like button so the YouTube algorithm will share all this good content with other people and for you to hit the subscribe button so you won't miss any good content coming your way. With that, back to the episode. So taking all of that information together, here is a resulting diagram for our minor control system. We have a temperature sensor giving us fluid temperature information, and we have a flow sensor giving us fluid flow information. We have something that can shut off the power to both the miners and the pump, and then we have some sort of logic device that's gonna take all these inputs from the sensors and send outputs to the power controls. Now, all of these components are going to have to work together and that's kind of the hard part of designing a control system. Often these different components are made by different manufacturers, and so you have to explore lots of websites, learning about different sensors and different controller technologies, and this can be a little overwhelming to put all of this together. Now to figure this out, I think it really helps to look at each component one at a time, starting with the logic device. Uh, once that logic device is chosen and figured out, choosing sensors and power controls that will work together becomes a little easier. Now when it comes to logic devices, there are a few different options that will work here. Uh, there are industrial PLCs or programmable logic controllers. Uh, you could use a small computer such as a Raspberry Pi or Arduino, or you could build some sort of low voltage relay circuit. Now what you choose here really comes down to you. Uh, you have to think about what technologies you're familiar with, what technologies you're comfortable with, uh, what are your coding skills, and uh, what are your wiring and circuit skills. But the truth is any of these will work. You just have to choose one and then build on from there. Now after you've figured out what logic device type you're going to use, the next step is going to look at temperature and flow sensors. And when it comes to these sensors, you have two different options for each of these. Uh, you have switch type sensors. Uh, these are sensors that will open or close a circuit depending on whether temperature or flow rate is above or below a threshold. The other option is continuous output sensors. Uh, these provide a continuous signal like a voltage or resistant that varies with the temperature and flow rate sensed in the device. Now both types will work. Uh, when it comes to switch sensors, they tend to be cheaper and simpler, and they are generally a little easier to integrate with a logic device. But the thing is, they only tell you if you are above or below a threshold. They really don't give you any other information about what really is going on in your system. Now, in contrast, continuous sensors will give you that continuous information about what is going on in your system. Uh, they'll provide some sort of voltage or resistance or some other continuous signal that is proportional to the measured temperature or flow rate. This is awesome because you will now know everything about what's going on in your system, but continuous sensors can be a bit more complicated to integrate into your control system. You'll need something that turns that continuous sensor output into something your logic device can use. And you also need that logic device to interpret the temperature or flow rate and then decide when to act on it. So you get more information with continuous sensors, but you have to do a little more work to handle that extra data. Now, besides integration with the logic device, another big thing to think about when you select your sensors is material compatibility with the dielectric coolant. These sensors will be embedded in this fluid for the life of the system, so you'll need to make sure that whatever sensor you select won't fall apart over time. 
Now, lucky for us, there are a lot of industrial processes out there using fluids that are a lot worse than dielectric coolant. So there are quite a few temperature and flow sensors out there that will work. Now, the last thing to cover when it comes to temperature and flow sensors is where to put them. Uh, and this is pretty straightforward. Now, the temperature sensor should be placed in the hot coolant outlet line coming out of your immersion tank. And by placing it here, it will immediately detect any unplanned temperature rise in the fluid coming off of your miners. And for the fluid flow sensor, it should be positioned in the output line of your pump. This way, any interruption or hiccup in your pump will immediately be picked up by the sensor. Now, the final part of the control system to cover is the output of the logic device and how it will control the power to your pump and your miners. Now, typical Bitcoin miners use a huge amount of electrical power, around 3,000 watts each. And in general, that's supplied via 220 to 240 volt power. Because of this, we need specialized hardware that can safely turn on and off the miner power. And there are really only a couple options here, PDUs and high power relays. PDU stands for Power Distribution Unit, and these units are essentially industrial-grade power strips. Uh, they take the 220 240 volt high current input and separate it into individual outputs for each miner. PDUs are made by a number of different manufacturers out there, and there are a lot of different models and types. Some are very simple, they just turn on and off the power. Others can have additional features, such as remote control, power fusing, power measurement. There's a lot of options out there to pick from. PDUs can be a great out-of-the-box option, but they can be a little pricey, particularly if you're only going to be controlling one or two miners. Uh, PDUs are generally designed for larger, more industrial size mining systems. Now, the other option to control miner power is high power relays. Now, there are a lot of different types of relays out there, but the type of relay I think best fits here is what is called a definite purpose contactor relay. These are relays that are designed to turn on and off HVAC and other high powered industrial systems. And so these relays are designed to handle the power levels and voltages used for miners. Uh, they're relatively cheap and they're made to be super reliable over the long term. However, these relays do have a downside. They are a raw electrical component that might take a little more effort to integrate into your control system. You'll have to figure out how to connect these to your miners, and you'll have to figure out how to power these devices from your logic device. But generally, they are an option to consider as an alternative to PDUs. Now, when it comes to your pump power, as we covered in previous episodes, most pumps used for a one to two miner setup are going to use 120 volt power. This means you'll either have to find a PDU that has both 220 volt and 124 volt output to handle both your miners and your pump, which isn't common, or you'll have to use a separate PDU or relay for your pump. Luckily, most pumps of this size do not require a lot of current, so there are a lot of different types of power relays that will work here. Now, before I end this episode, I wanna spend a couple minutes talking about some really important safety topics around powering your miners. First, many miners require two power input cables, each supplying 220 to 240 volt at, say, 15 to 20 amps. Some folks have built their miners using a single high power source and then simply divided this into two cables going into their miners. And my advice here is, please don't do this. Uh, with this wiring scheme, if there is any kind of short on one side of your cabling due to a minor failure or some other short, all of the power from this output will be driven down that single line. Most monitor cables and power connectors are not built to handle this power level. And when you overpower a cable or connector, you are starting a fire that could damage your equipment, could injure you, or burn down your house. Also, if you happen to be working in and around your miner when this happened, this could result in you getting a dangerous or lethal shock. So please do not use this wiring scheme. Instead, when you build your power cabling, you really need to have an individual circuit breaker or fuse for each power line going into your miner. Now, if you choose to use a PDU, many of these have integrated breakers built into each power output. But if you go the route of a definite purpose contactor relay, you'll have to build in some sort of fusing or circuit breaker to protect your system from this type of short. The other safety issue I want to talk about is cord compatibility with the dielectric coolant. If you use a cord made with insulating material that is not compatible 
Over time, the insulation may degrade and fall apart. And when this happens, you risk having your cable create a short, and again, there's a risk of fire or electrical shock. So in choosing your electrical cords, you'll want to follow your dielectric cooling fluid material compatibility guidelines. Most will recommend an SJE OOW or SE OOW type electrical cord. Now, there are a lot of letters here, but let's focus on the E and the O. The E means the cords have thermoplastic insulation, which should be compatible with dielectric fluids. And the double O means the cord has both oil resistant jacket and oil resistant insulation, which again should mean you should be compatible with dielectric fluids. Now, you can sometimes find these type of cords off the shelf or you can always contact custom cable manufacturers who can make some cable for you so you can build your own cords. Okay, so that's it for minor control systems. We covered why you might want to add a control system to your minor setup, and we covered how to design one that will protect your minor. In the next episode, I'm going to show you how I use this information to build the control system for my setup. So with that, bye.